Welcome to the Untold Story Podcast, everybody. I'm Martha McCallum. Great to have you with me today. And I'm very pleased to be joined by Sam Brown, who is the Senate candidate in the Nevada race. He is a Purple Heart recipient, a proud veteran, a small business owner, and he is running against Jackie Rosen, who is uh, running to be in her second term in Nevada. So Sam, welcome. Great to have you with us today. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Martha. It's uh, it's great to be here, especially with um, just uh, just under three weeks left. I know what do, you know. I want to dig back into your background a bit, but just give us the headline. How are you feeling right now, three weeks out, and what has this been like for somebody who's brand new to politics? <laughs> you know, it's a it's a different type of battlefield than I'm. I uh, you know was prepared for and trained for uh, years ago, uh, but. You know, the the thing that I love about this endeavor is that every day I get to encounter voters who are really looking for leadership. They're looking for someone who understands their concerns, uh, understands the, the solutions and is a symbol of hope. And as someone who um, needed a symbol of hope. Uh, mm-hmm. At one point in my life, uh, when I was when I thought I was going to die on the battlefield, um, I, I know how powerful that can be, and, and that I can be that for somebody else because my life had been saved um, is is really special and meaningful, and, and it gives me the energy um, and the motivation to keep going. So this podcast is called The Untold Story for a reason, and and it's not that your story has been untold, but for anybody who doesn't know the story of Sam Brown, I find it personally very inspiring and your commitment to the country. You graduated from West Point um, and then you went off to Afghanistan uh, to serve as an infantry officer after West Point in the 3rd Brigade. But tell us what happened on that day, Sam, that that really changed your life and your trajectory. So we were on a on a mission that uh, we're providing security for a multi multinational uh, mission that ultimately was supposed to put uh, turbines into a dam on the Helmand River. So we were in Kandahar, basically a U.S., Canadian, British, Afghan, um, I, I think the Danes were part of it. There, there was multiple countries, all part of moving this equipment to a dam uh, in the Hel- Helmand province. They had to drive through our battalion's area of operation. And uh, they had made it out there successfully, dropped it all off. What I learned later, actually, Martha, is, and this is maybe one of the untold parts, um, is this was the largest uh, multinational convoy since World War II. Mm. And, you know, the the point of it was to was to provide power for southern Afghanistan. This was, you know, part of our kind of winning hearts and minds or nation building mission, you know, to provide legitimacy to the to the Afghan government um, to help the people look, you know, there as, as opposed to the Taliban for um, governance. And as this convoy was departing the dam site and coming back and we were providing security along the route, um, some of our friendly forces came under fire and we happen to be the closest to them. And so we're maneuvering to go provide the support they needed, uh, that they requested. And, um, that's when my vehicle struck a roadside bomb that had been placed, you know, in anticipation of that. Um, and so here we are kind of in the midst of an ambush. Um, when the bomb went off, it, uh, it engulfed me in flames. The diesel fuel from my truck, um, was just, you know, it saturated me. And I was I was burning there, Martha, in the in the desert. Uh, it was right at dusk, and and I remember the most important moment there is that I, for the first time in my life, I was 24 years old, West Point grad, Ranger School grad. You know, pretty tough. I realized I'd come up against something I couldn't control the outcome myself, and I just knew it in my heart. And it was scary. It was it was the most raw. Um, and complete fear I'd ever felt in my life. And I was screaming out for God and I was screaming for my mom. And, um, you know, I think, uh, she, she heard my screams and God heard my pleas. Um, cause she, here, here's one of the untold parts. Um, we, we figure as we went back and looked at it at that point in time, she had just dropped my younger siblings off at school. And she had like this, like this vision of me wrapped in gauze um, Mm. as she was driving uh, back home from dropping the kids off at school. And, and she just offered up a prayer and um, God heard that, that prayer 
heard my cries and and one of my soldiers um, saw me and came uh, running to me and screamed out, sir, I've got you. And that was the spark of hope I needed because I had just got done thinking to myself, how long is it going to take to burn to death? Mm. What's the transition from this life to the next going to be like? And I gave up the will to live. And so a version of me died at that moment. But then when he screamed out, sir, I've got you, it was like fresh life was breathed back into me. And he ran to me and others joined and they began to smother the flames. And and uh, that was the beginning of a new life. And that was, you know, 16 years ago. Um, and uh, Martha, I know we don't want to talk about this, you know, fully, but uh, my wife and I did just publish a book called Alive Day. That was my Alive Day. Mm -hmm. um, my wife had her own version of an Alive Day uh, right around the same time. Um, and so we, uh, it's on Amazon. People can find it. Um, but it's it's just, a, it's about finding hope and purpose after losing everything. And, uh, and so we're happy to share that with the world and hope it encourages others. Well, I think your story is very encouraging and your devotion uh, to, to the country, to our country and your service is so admirable. Um, since you, you mentioned your wife, I love the story of how you met. Can you share that with everyone? You bet. Uh, <laughs> so um, I guess to set it up, you know, at this point, so I went from being this, you know, this strong, you know, man who just thought he was invincible, you know, on top of the world to very quickly in the ICU, wrapped in gauze on a ventilator. I couldn't feed myself. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't take care of myself. Initially, I couldn't even walk. And so that's how Amy met me was I was, I was unconscious in the ICU. She worked there um, in the Army burn unit in San Antonio, Texas, a young first lieutenant. And I, I got to meet her several months later. And, um, and, and little did I know she was very aware of me, but when I became aware of her, um, I thought, you know, here's, here's someone who is my age, my rank. Um, there weren't a whole lot of other young first lieutenants in the army there in the burn unit. Um, and so there just seemed to be this sort of opportunity for a connection, but frankly, Martha, I thought that, uh, I thought someone of, you know, of, of her, quality and caliber would not be interested in a guy who was at the lowest point in his life. And um, so when I, when I finally sort of mustered up the, the courage to, to approach her and see if she would, you know, spend a little bit of time hanging out with me, um, I didn't have the exactly the best pickup line. She, she still likes to rub this in my face, but the best thing I could come up with was, um, you know, would you like to spend a little bit of Lieutenant time together? <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible. It was terrible. Uh, but, but it worked though. You you can always put that back at her because it did well, work. That, that part didn't work. What what she told me later, she didn't tell me on the spot, but the thing that really worked was as a dietitian, when I came into her office and I just was like, Hey, you know, what's going on? What are you doing? She said, Oh, well, I'm I'm, you know, charting um notes for my patients, you know, what what their calorie accounts are and stuff like that. I was like, Oh, calories. Are you talking about calories or kilocalories? And she, she just kind of looked at me like, what is this guy? Like, what does he think he knows? And she said, do you know what a calorie is? And I said, oh yeah, of course. A calorie is the amount of energy required to change one milliliter or one cubic centimeter of water, one degree Celsius or Kelvin. And it turns out that was actually the thing that impressed her and, uh, <laughs> and why, why we got to go spend that first date together at the rodeo. So you took her to a rodeo and... Um... How so? How many years have you been married, and and what um what's your family like now? Yeah, so we've we've been married fifteen years. Um, so that was that was um the rodeo was in February of '09. We started dating in March of '09. Um, Amy gave me a deadline, so she she she's a she's a a a very uh, highly convicted person and I don't like to miss deadlines. So she gave me a deadline. We were engaged in April of 09 and we were married in May of 09. And um, so one month, one month engagement. I love that. I think yes. that's great. Like I wouldn't necessarily advise it for, for anyone else. It, it happened to work really well for us. And um, so we've been married for 15 years. We've got three kiddos Um our oldest son, you know, he's 13 now. I probably should stop calling him a kiddo. Um, yeah, that's okay. Oldest... I have, you know, 24 year olds that I still refer to as my, my kids. So, okay. All right. Fair enough. So <laughs> I'm 13. sure your mom would probably say the same about you. No, she probably would. 
she probably would. Um, and uh, we've got a 13 or no 13 year old son, 11 year old daughter and a nine year old son. But, you know, I mean, you can appreciate this. How much more do you learn about yourself as a parent than than before? Yeah, yeah, a lot. I mean, I always feel like the biggest thing that I learned as a parent is that you cannot possibly understand how much your parents love you until you are a parent. Yeah, 100%. What's the biggest thing you've learned being a parent? Um, I think I've, you, you, for me, I've really had to learn what, you know, selflessness is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's easy to live a life and make decisions with only your own consideration. Um, or, you know, if you happen to be married, but without kids, you know, like it's just the, the, the calculus is easier. Once you have kids, you know, it's everything changes and you have, yeah. you have people who are dependent on you to make decisions, not only for yourself, but for them in mind. Um, and, and that, that has to go into everything. The untold story continues right after this. So I, I want to talk to you for the second um, part here about this race that you're in, in Nevada, about three weeks to go. And you have been the underdog in this race against Jackie Rosen. Give me your sense. I, I believe that uh, 2004 is the last time that Republicans won in Nevada. And it was pretty close between Trump and Biden in 2020. So give me your sense of this race. As, as far as I can see on most of the polling, you've been uh, behind pretty much the whole way yeah. so far. Yeah. No, I mean, let's call it what it is. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm the underdog. Um, and it, it may not surprise uh, you or this audience at this point. I'm, I'm OK being the underdog. Um, that's uh, I, I operate best at that point. Um, but look, this is a seat that um, uh, Senator Jackie Rosen is coming up on the end of her first term. She was a Harry Reid protege. Most people probably remember that name. Uh, Harry Reid was the uh, the former very powerful uh, Democrat uh, Senate Majority Leader, and um, and so Jackie kind of was able to fall in on the machine that he built here. Um, so, you know, going up against that, even even if even if the polls were exactly tied, and you know, and I'm trailing just a little bit in some polls and and more and others, but. Um, you'll always be an underdog going up against an incumbent like that. But at the end of the day that, you know, that opens up a, a window and motivation for me to get out and talk to the voters in a very personal way, in a grassroots way. I mean, I am all over the state in the community. In fact, we do what I call campaigning community events where I get out there and people are hungry, Martha. They want to, they want to meet the person that is, is, mm -hmm. you know, attempting to represent them. And the issues, the issues, what what's heartbreaking but also motivating is the issues are are such that people need hope, as we talked about earlier. They need a champion. And here in our state, um, now compared to four years ago, the average household is paying twelve hundred dollars a month more um, just for the cost of living. You know, energy prices are up, food prices are up, um, housing prices, rents up, um, and a lot of folks just can't afford that. You know, the the border crisis. Is, is hurting our communities. Um, and Senator Rosen has been on one side of both of those. She's been for more spending, which has led to increased prices. She sits on Homeland Security Committee and has never pushed back against this administration and their border policy um, and has so has been complicit there. Um, and and this pain that people is feeling um, is real. And, and I think at this point, um, folks know what President Trump stands for. And they're they're just finally understanding that I'm for them too. I'm for uh, lowering the cost of housing. I'm for lowering the cost of the essentials like food, fuel, medication. I'm for eliminating tax on tips, uh, eliminating tax on Social Security benefits. Um, I'm for securing the border. I'm for regaining American, um, you know, strength in our military and the peace that that brings worldwide. So, I know. Um... President Trump was in Nevada a couple of days. I think it was last week. And were you campaigning with him? Yes. Yes. I've been with President Trump uh, the last couple of times he's been in state. Um, we did a big rally um, together in Reno. Um, just uh, 
a few days ago. The following day, we were together in Las Vegas um, for um, a a roundtable in the with the, the Hispanic community, some you know small business owners and and other community leaders. Um, and uh, and I'm he told me he's going to be back again. So um, well, I'm sure I'll be seeing him here in the next uh, week or so. Um, Nevada is an important state in the presidential race, um, but it's also clearly an important state for the Senate. Uh, race and in taking the majority. We're one of the battleground states that, as President Trump put it last time he was in Vegas, um, he said, look, when I win um, Nevada, I win the White House. And when Sam wins mm-hmm. uh, the Senate race, we take the majority. So um, there's no pressure, right? <laughs> um, not at all. Um, you know, Jackie Rosen has sort of hugged a, a moderate um, label a moderate Democrat label as, as Senator. And I know abortion is one of the issues that is um, significant in Nevada. And I think there's an abortion ballot measure that will be on the ballot on November 5th, correct in Nevada. That's right. So explain to me the dynamic of that and how you see that playing out, because we do see this very significant gender gap across the country um, at the presidential level and at the Senate and house level. Yeah, so um, it's it's an issue that that is on the ballot um, this time, and and uh, Senator Rosen is is you know really trying to lean into that. the The sad thing is, Martha, um, is is the way that an issue that is so personal uh, to so many people, um, to so many women, and, and also to families, is that it has been politicized in such a partisan way um, that. Um, you know, folks like Senator Rosen would lean into deception. Um, look, this this is a personal issue for us. When I mentioned earlier that, you know, I had my own alive day and getting blown up in Afghanistan, that same that same month, um, in fact, the same week that I got blown up, Amy had been in a really tough relationship and had an unexpected pregnancy, and um, really felt trapped, and that the only the only solution to this unexpected pregnancy was to have an abortion. And that was a very, very traumatic experience for her, um, one that just left her devastated. And so as I was recovering um, from my wounds, Amy was trying to recover from her own wounds. And that's when we really kind of came together. And that was one of the things that really helped us gel was supporting one another. And so I've got a lot of empathy for people who find themselves in that, you know, in a situation where they're they're pregnant and in a and it's unexpected or, you know, it's stressful and, and they're searching for, you know, what do they do? And and the fact that that scenario would be politicized the way it is, is sad. We we need to do more to support women who find themselves in an unexpected pregnancy or families um, who find themselves in an unexpected pregnancy and are struggling with, you know, can they afford to have a child at this time? Um, but here in Nevada, the law is settled. It's been settled for 34 years. Um people have access to abortion up to 24 weeks and and beyond for you know rape incest threat to the life of a mother and those are that's I support Nevada's law and I have pledged to Nevada I I, I, I will not cannot do anything to change that mm-hmm. furthermore I will never vote for a federal abortion ban I won't vote on that it's, I'm, a, I'm a no on on federal legislation and so um it's it's sad to see someone like Senator Rosen use this issue um, to try and manipulate or or use fear to motivate uh, voters, um, but I'm I, I just I want to see us do more to support families instead of you know seeking to uh, to tear others down. The untold story continues right after this. You know I, I want to ask you a big picture question about this gender gap and why do you think it is that men and particularly young men and it it really crosses over racial lines as well hispanic black white young men seem to be the edge for president trump why do you think that is you know that's that's a really good question and i honestly haven't really thought about this before um if i had to guess i would say that you know what's what's really been hurt these last few years is um, is the ability for people to to be able to kind of 
pursue their their own American dream. I can't tell you how many people I talk to, Martha, that, that um, you know, grew up here. Maybe they moved here to go to to go to university, and you know, they're trying to they're trying to start a family. Um, you know, they want to get married. They want to kind of plant roots, and and they can't afford to live in Nevada. You know, the jobs just aren't providing enough um, enough, you know, income for them to be able to buy a house. The, the median home price is here over $400,000, but the median, um, you know, household income is $64,000. I mean, mm -hmm. there's just this disparity between what, what people are, what they're living and experiencing economically and, and what they want. Um, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't be such a large gap. And I think that what president Trump offers to that young man that you asked about is he offers, hope that we can we can refine that path to the American dream that a young man can go out and and achieve what he needs to 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 either live a, a satisfying life on his own or if he wants to you know start a family that he can do that and have confidence that he can you know provide and and, and have children and you know and be able to provide for those children if we go back full circle in our conversation you know mm -hmm. at the end of the day just you know the 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 test, but also the joy and the satisfaction of knowing that we we can shape and give a young person um, a start in life is 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 a uniquely human thing um, that uh, that I think a lot of folks want to be able to do at least have the option to do, and right now it feels so close to so many. So. I want to ask you about foreign policy, given your background in the military and your commitment to serving the country. Where do you stand on the issue of our commitment to Ukraine? Um, look, I, I think that we need to be committed to supporting our our allies. Um, but if we if we go back, let's let's just remember how how we got into this situation. We got here because of weakness in U.S. leadership. Um, when when President Trump was in office, you know, leading up to that to that election um, and, uh, and, you know, for 2016 was, oh, Trump's going to get us in all these wars. Well, he didn't get us in any new wars. Um, in fact, you know, we have the, the 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 peace that seemed like it would never be possible was beginning to form between Israel and some of, you know, the, the Middle mm -hmm. Eastern countries. Um, and so. What I'm getting to is we need to get back to a place where the United States has strong leadership internationally and leadership that results in peace. And we can get that again. Um, we need to be committed to ensuring that Putin does not get to be a thug, does not get to be a bully. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, what's happened in Ukraine is, is a travesty. Probably hundreds of thousands of lives have been lost. Um, you know, I've had some people say, Sam, how do we, how do we win this war? Like Martha, there's no winning this thing at this point. Like this, this is such a travesty and it's a travesty of leadership because the United States was not committed in this Biden administration to preventing this conflict or for bringing it to a close fast enough that there's been, um, just devastating loss that, that cannot be replaced, but mm -hmm. we need to bring this conflict to a close as fast as possible. So in closing, when you look at this election, what do you think you need to accomplish in order to win right now? And do you do you think the polls are are accurate? Do you think that they reflect where you stand right now? So, no, I don't think the polls are accurate. And and I'm not, you know, I'm not a, a, a pundit. Um, but what I can tell you is, what I feel, having lived through the 16 cycle, the 20 cycle, and now, what it feels like out there on the ground is that there is a larger, more committed silent majority than there was in the 16. And and those folks aren't responding to polls. Um, I know that people, you know, really want to analyze and, and get into polls. And look, the range on the polls has me down from minus seven to a recent poll also had me down by one and a half points. Mm -hmm. So, and that was... That was not my own poll. That was uh, actually the pollster that had that one and a half point poll was rated the most accurate pollster in the 2020 presidential cycle. So, um, so who knows where the where the polls really are? They're they're not consistent, but the people seem hungry for change. 
They want leadership that understands the issues. They want leadership that can relate to them. They want leadership who have solutions that are credible to help them where their pain is, is highest. And that's what I offer. And that's why I think that continuing over these last few weeks to just be with the people, um, be out there talking to them, um, why that's going to be a difference maker and uh, why we're ultimately going to win. I'll be a part of the new uh, Republican Senate majority. President Trump is going to win Nevada. He hasn't won in 2016, didn't win in 2020 here, uh, but he'll win in 2024. And uh, look, our best days can still be ahead. And uh, and people in this audience from across the country can join us on this journey by going to CaptainSamBrown.com and chipping in just a few bucks, even here in these closing weeks. Every dollar matters, just like every vote matters. And uh, so I'm just great, grateful for for the support from across the country we've had. Well, I, I said that was my last question, but I'm going to tag one more on here. It's been really a pleasure talking to you. Um, and when I talk to people like you who are first time candidates, what has surprised you the most about the process? And what bothers you the most about this process of trying to win an election in America? Oh my goodness, Martha. Um, this this is probably a whole nother podcast when we get on the other <laughs> side of this. Um, <laughs> Um, it, it, it's a, it's an untold story, but, um, I've been, I've been, um, shocked at how much people who claim to be aligned on things will, will really try and be the demise of each other. Um, and so there's, there is fighting on our side and, you know, it's, it's almost, it's almost all, you know, in the primary process, but it's just amazing how, together the democrats seem to be you know this unified front mm -hmm. uh, versus the sort of fighting that goes on with republicans and and it's it's sad to see it's surprising um but uh it doesn't always have to be that way once they overthrew their candidate and replaced their lead candidate in the national race um then then i guess they're they're united right right well Thank you very much, Captain Sam Brown. We will be watching your race and we look forward to seeing the outcome on election night as we, um, are, when we're able to call the race in, in Nevada, we'll be uh, thinking about our conversation with you. And we really appreciate you joining me today for the untold story. Thanks, Martha. I really appreciate it. And uh, hope everyone will enjoy the book, Alive Day. And uh, if you can support the campaign financially, do it at captainsambrown.com. And, and thanks again, Martha. We'll talk to you soon. Great. Thanks for letting everyone know those details and um, good luck with your race. And we look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you, Captain Brown. That's great. That is the untold story with Captain Sam Brown, Senate candidate in the Nevada race. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to The Untold Story with Martha McCallum. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Make sure to rate and review. For more podcasts, go to foxnewspodcast.com. Listen ad-free with a Fox News Podcast Plus subscription on Apple Podcasts. And Amazon Prime members can listen to this show ad-free on the Amazon Music app. 